this passage that I want to read to you from the 14th chapter of John is familiar to us. In my father's house are many rooms. And then he goes on to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So that part we're familiar with. The latter part of this particular portion of, of the chapter 14 is not as familiar with us. So let me read starting with verse 7. Jesus said, if you know me, you will know my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not believe, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in his Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. Pause with me for a moment of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. I just pray that you will take my words, take this message, and through your Holy Spirit, that you will speak not just to our minds and our hearts, but speak directly to our lives. For I pray these things in your name. Amen. That last part, which I just read to you, is very intriguing to me, where Jesus says that those who believe in me will do the works that I do. In fact, will do even greater works. And if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. It almost sounds unbelievable, because Jesus did some very amazing things. Not just the blind had their sight restored, the deaf could hear, the lame could walk, those with leprosy were healed, even raising some who had already died. I think of that story with uh, Jairus, where his, he was a synagogue leader and his daughter was very, very sick. And like any parent, would be very deeply concerned about the well-being of their child. So he goes to Jesus and asks that Jesus would come and just lay his hands on his daughter so that she may be made well. But on their way there, someone comes and says, don't bother the teacher, for your daughter has already died. But Jesus continues going to Jairus' house and he says to the people there that she's not dead, she's just sleeping. Well, what do they do? They laugh at him because they know what death looks like. But he goes in, and moments later, he comes out with this girl alive and well. Imagine who's surprised then. Or you have the raising of Lazarus from the dead, who had been dead for just about three days. I like that story from the Old Testament about Elijah. It's one that's familiar to many of us. Elijah, during a time of famine, was told by God to go to Zarephath where he will meet a widow and he is to stay with her. So he makes his way to Zarephath, sees this one woman, asks her for some water, and by the way, while you're at it, bring me some bread, to which she responds, I don't have much flour left. In fact, I was just going to make a last meal for my son and myself, and then we're just going to lay down and wait to die. Just do it, and God will take care of it. He will resupply you with flour and with olive oil. Now, that's a miracle in itself. Every day for who knows how many months that this took place. But when her son died, even Elijah struggled with that. Why, God? Why did you allow her son to die? Elijah takes this boy, goes up into his chamber, lays himself on this boy's body three times, and life is restored to the body to this boy. A similar thing happens to Elisha. In his instance, the boy had been dead for probably several hours, if not even a day or two. So even that, and Jesus and his followers do things even more amazing than him. I think of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul didn't heal someone of blindness. He caused someone to become blind because he was creating such a stir in Paul's ministry. Paul also healed a crippled person. Remember the story of Eutychus? Eutychus was this young man 
that was sitting in the windowsill while Paul is preaching to a group of people and he was preaching until midnight and it was w very warm in that room and this boy fell asleep and shoot, went down three stories and died. And Paul goes down with others and Paul brings him back to life. Paul was not surprised at what he did. So what does he do? He goes up and he continues preaching to the people. So that's what's so amazing that uh, Jesus is making those words. And some are saying, some have said that, well, Jesus' words only applied to the apostles. And at that point, a lot of this just stops. But that's not true because there have been healings and miracles throughout history that have been recorded. And it, even in modern times, there's a professor that I had out when I was doing my Doctor of Ministry program in, in Fuller uh, Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California, who claimed, because he had been a missionary before coming to Fuller, he was a missionary in South America, and he said that he had a gift of being able to heal people whose one leg was shorter than the other. And he could pray for that person, and he could just see that leg getting longer as he was praying for that person. Now that sounds unbelievable. I can't affirm it. I can't deny it. I can only take him at his word is that what he said he had that power to bring that kind of healing. Back in 2003, 2003, my youngest sister was diagnosed as four, stage four of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Stage four is not a good sign. But she went through different rounds of chemotherapy. We prayed for her. And today, she's fine. She has a granddaughter. Her name is Allie. We're praying for Allie because Allie, at 23 years old, is dealing with cancer. She was having some health problems starting a couple years ago. They diagnosed this as cancer getting up to the brain. And right now, she's undergoing proton therapy. And we're praying for her that through the therapy, through prayers, that she will become well. I remember when I was growing up, I'd occasionally watch on TV some of these faith healers. And one that comes to mind is Oral Roberts. Remember Oral Roberts? And I have pictures in my mind of people coming down and he would put his hand on their forehead and I guess his other hand behind the neck and he'd heal in the name of Jesus. And I was thinking he's going to break this person's neck in what he's doing. And since then, I've learned there's a lot of, for lack of a better word, qu quackery about faith healers. And, you know, they would uh, do a lot of subterfuge, where they would bring someone down in a wheelchair. They would act like that they were crippled up. They would pray for him. The person would get up and then walk, and there would have been nothing wrong with them in the first place. But there are also instances where they made the situation worse for that individual, having them do something which they really should not have done, and it caused the injury to get even worse. So the idea of faith healing is, really does not have a positive connotation in my mind. But yet, there's something that happened early on in my ministry, not so much to me, but I was reading about a fellow in Canton, Ohio, and to my surprise, a Presbyterian minister by the name of, name of Don Berthoff, who was doing healing ministries in his church there in Canton, Ohio. And he was writing about the um, ministry and the healing that has been bringing to people and so forth. And he'd written articles and books and he went on speaking circuit and so forth. So that was my first kind of introduction in a Presbyterian way. It was somewhere around the late 1980s, 1990s that I went to a conference in a, I think it was a Church of Christ in Oak Brook, Illinois. And they were doing for people with ministers and lay people within the area to come to services of wholeness. And they were called services of wholeness for a reason. Because it's not just physical ailments that we deal with, but we also have things that affect the mind and things that affect the soul. And scripture teaches us that we are not three different parts of mind, body, and soul, but we are integrated into one, where one can easily affect the other. For instance, if you have back pain, or a toothache, or you stub your toe, or you have feet problems and it causes pain, it doesn't just cause a physical pain, but you feel that emotionally, and if that pain goes on long enough and it's hard enough, you can feel it in the very depths of your soul. But also, depression. 
depression with this in the mind that a lot of people experiencing depression and some even deep depression. They may not know what the cause is. There's a lot of medication that's out there to camouflage that. But depression can affect someone physically, can make them tired all the time, lack of energy, where all they want to do is sleep. So physically, depression can affect us, and it certainly can go into the very depths of one's soul. Worry. We have that expression that he or she worry themselves sick. And we can worry over our own health, worry over the health of a spouse, of our children or our grandchildren. We can worry about what may happen in the future. Some people worry that bad things might happen to them that they would have no control over, but they still worry about that. And that can affect one's internal system. You have stress, and we put this in, in, your, in your bulletins. I want to put this up on the board. You have two doctors. One is Dr. Holmes, and the other is Dr. Masuda from the University of Washington in Seattle, where they did a study of the effects of stress upon the body. And I think a lot of us are, are aware of this. And stress, as you know, is not just negative things that happen. They can be positive things that happen to us that still bring stress into our lives. And they come up with a scale that if you have like 150 to close to 200, you're in mild stress. From 2 to about 300, you're in moderate stress. And if you have over 300 points, you're in major stress. And then they have this chart. And I'm just going to look at some of them. If you've had the death of a spouse, and some of you have had that and it happened recently, it automatically gives you 100 points. But depending upon how that death happened, whether if there's a long illness there, you can add even more points. If it was a sudden heart attack or a car accident that you know, brought on the death, these things can add even more points to it. If you're going through a divorce, that adds points into your life. Or if you're having to have children and all of a sudden you find yourself single as a single parent, again, that will add even more points. You can have death of a close friend. That will give you 63 points. You have personal injury and illness, 53 points. Marriage, even, gives you 50 points. If you have a new baby, that brings. And in our instance, if you have a new dog that comes into your life, that can be stressful, too. <laughs> Believe me. Uh, as I mentioned, pregnancy, change in financial status, change in a different line of work, Change in responsibilities at work, that'll give you 29 points. Son or daughter leaving home, or son or daughter moving back home. You know, all of these things can cause stress. You know, the next line, I guess we're already down there. Um, you have change in residence, change in church activities, change in sleeping habits, change in eating habits, vacation. Vacations we look forward to, but how many of us go on vacation and just things just go awry? One thing after another, it seems. So all of these things can add stress to us. So you can look at that, and what does stress do? It's an attack on our bodies. It not only can cause stomach and digestive problem, problems, it can cause heart attacks, it can cause stroke, it can even cause cancer. So we have these things where what happens with our mind affects us physically. And you look at things within our soul. Anger is an emotion, but anger, if we hang on to that and it turns into bitterness and resentment, that can eat at us like acid. If we have guilt over something that we did or didn't do or should have done, and we let that guilt dwell in us, again, it can cause physical problems. Our memories. Things that have happened to us, even when we were a child, if we had, had a parent that died when we were very young, or a brother or sister that died, these things can have an impact on us that can carry on well into even adulthood. Or if we were abused as a child, and it's not just sexually abused, but if we were verbally abused, all of these things can have an effect upon us. And all of that can affect us physically, it can affect our emotions. So, when we're looking at these services of wholeness, we're looking at our whole being. So after I went to this conference in Oak Brook, I got to think, well, maybe I could try some of these wholeness services in our own church. But I was reluctant to do that. And one reason was because I don't have the gift of healing. And the other thought came to my mind, is, what if we do these things and nobody gets healed? <laughs> 
Well, then I came to realize, well, I'm not the one that does the healing. That if the healing is to take place, it is God through the Holy Spirit or through the presence of Christ that will bring healing to us. So I did this, not just in the, the church up in the Chicago area, but we did this in the Huntsville Church, First Presbyterian downtown. And if you know anything about that church, you know, you know healing services, services of wholeness, are probably not going to go over very well. But we did that. And we did it on a Thursday night, and we did it once a month. And what we would do, we'd have a little message on one of Jesus' healings, We'd have a card that would be put in the, the, um, uh, the bulletins that they could put their name on. They could write the person that they wouldn't have prayed for and just a brief description of the situation. And then we would invite people to come forward. And we had a couple people that would pray for them if there were a large number. Now I recognize that you know, a, services of wholeness are hard to maintain. And for a small church, it can be next to impossible. But what I want to say is the church has something here that we can offer to the community that you'll find nowhere else. Where can you go to find a group of people who will pray for other people's well-being and wholeness? You can't go to a civic organization of Rotary or Kiwanis or some sporting club or so forth. It could happen at work, but no more than likely it would not happen at work, but it happens in the church, and it's something that we have a unique opportunity. And how one does that, I don't know. But I know it's something that we as churches, and I'm not just saying specifically our church, but as the church has, it's a ministry that we can offer to people outside the church. And it's something that is a very definite need that's in every community that churches are a part of. In a few moments, we're going to be celebrating the sacrament of communion. Communion is something that we, that I feel, we have not really emphasized enough the healing aspect that can come through communion. I want you to kind of follow my reasoning here. Jesus said of the bread, this is my body. Of the cup, he said, this is my blood. Now, in Hebraic understanding, when you talk about bread and wine, body and blood, what Jesus is saying, this is me. This is my presence. And this is why some, some that we don't emphasize enough within Presbyterian circles. I'm not talking about in some traditions where it becomes the actual body and blood of Christ. But it's more than just a symbol. But in some way, Christ imbues his presence within these elements. So if Jesus could bring healing while he was physically present here on earth, why can he not also bring healing to us through his presence within the sacrament of communion? So let me ask you, where do you need the healing touch of Christ? Is it something physical that you're dealing with? Is it something that is affecting the mind, like depression or worry or stress? Is it something that's deep-seated? Something that maybe you're not even aware of, but God, through his Holy Spirit, could make you aware of it. Something that happened when you were a child, or something that just is there constantly on your mind, maybe even in a subconscious way, but it continues to affect you in some way. Where do you need that healing touch of Christ. And if not you directly, it may be a spouse. It may be a son or daughter. It may be a grandchild. It may be a close friend that you can serve as a proxy for. And as you come forward to receive the elements, you can be praying for them. And that God, through his Holy Spirit and through the very presence of Christ, can bring about a healing because God wants us to be whole. And I recognize there's some things that we will not be healed from. And that ultimately the healing is going to come when we are not a part of this world anymore, but we are within God and his eternal kingdom. That's when we'll experience true wholeness. But I believe God wants us to be whole now. And I believe that he will bring a healing to us. It may not be the one we're asking, but he may bring a healing where we have an acceptance of what's taking place within us or that assurance that no matter what happens, that God will be with us and he will see us through us.